So they gave up, Jahur, Tapam, they gave up the uh, distress born of separation. Vida, Vida means separation. Vida, Jam, born of separation. Ani, it's sort of a uh, clever use of words because uh, any, if any of you have gone to Vrindavan the wrong time of the year, you know how hot it can be. And um, so the idea here is they gave up the heat during the day. But it, it, of course, here at Tapa means the, the, the stress. And during the day, because Krishna and Vrindavan had a day job, you know, he would take the cows out to the pasture. And so in the early morning, Krishna would, you know, he would be there in the village and in the evening he would come back. But during the day, that was a problem because Krishna was out with his coward boyfriend. So it's sort of a play on words, giving up the heat of the day. But taking the other common meaning of the words means giving up the distress during the day that we're born of separation from Krishna. So Pitwa Makunda Mukasara Gamachi Bringais to Tapam Juhu. So when he came back, that's the idea when Krishna came back in the evening and they saw his face again, they gave up that distress, born of separation during the day. And then Tat third line. Satkriti Samadhi Gamya Vivesha Ghostam So then 
Krishna, uh, Satratim, it's a very interesting expression, sat, uh, sat, the word sat plus any form of a verb to do or to make, such as kriti here. By the way, we still have that word in English, the Sanskrit verb to do or to make, kriti, kara, and, and words, English words like create or increase. And so literally to make sat, that, that's a sort of an idiomatic expression which is often used in Sanskrit to mean to honor someone or respect someone, to, to make them sat or to regard them as you know, in a spiritual proper way. So Krishna, tat sat kriti samadhi gamya, then Krishna, uh, having achieved that respect or honor from the gopis, uh, Sanskrit is so interesting, just give you an idea because of course you have to pick an English word to translate it, but there's really a lot there. So even this word samadhi gamya, which Prabhupada translates fully accepting, uh, is actually formed of three elements, there's sam, adhi, and gamya. Ga, ga in Sanskrit is just English go, we have the same word in English, ga, go. So, uh, and sam means completely, as Prabhupada says here, or fully, but also means together, as in sankirtan. So you can see how these two meanings are related in Sanskrit, because when everything is together, then it's complete. So that's why sam can mean together, but also can mean fully or completely. So an adi is over, to be above. And so, sam adi gamya, uh, literally fully or to going over it in the sense of accepting it from a higher position. Or from a position of being the one who's honored. So, when we're reading Sanskrit, of course, you have to pick an English word, but there's really, there's a lot there in every word. So, that's what Krishna did with that honor. Tat sat kratin sam adi gamya. Having achieved that or having you know, accepted it. Vivesha Goswami entered the, um, literally the cow, the cow place, which uh, of course here means uh, the cow or village, the Goswami. And Sabrida Hasa Vinayam Garapanga Moksham. And Krishna also accepted their um, Apanga Moksham, which is often translated uh, sidelong glances. Sidelong glances and um, which sa the, the four oh we didn't chant that yet okay sabrida sabrida asa asa vinayam vinayam yat yat pandavoksham pandavoksham so sa means with here and sabrida with shame uh, but it also means uh, here shyness. So Sabrina would mean shyly, with shyness. Let's talk about the gopis. Vrita uh, and Hasa smiling and vinayam, humility, their uh, Pandu Moksha, their glances. So they glanced at Krishna with a very intense, loving glance, which, and of course, Radharani is the central gopi. So these glances were, had the qualities of shyness and, and smiling, and humility. So, that's the verse. Now we can chant this verse together, uh, responsibly. Pitva mukunda mukasara gamakshi bringais Pitva mukunda mukasara gamakshi bringais Sorry for the spontaneous new melody. Okay, I'll try to do more conventional melody. Pitva Mukunda Mukasarga Makshi Bringais Pitva Mukunda Mukasarga Makshi Bringais Tabam Jahur Virajam Braja Yoshitovni Tabam Jahur Virajam Braja Yoshitovni Tat Samadhi Gamya Vivesha Goshtam Tat Satritim Samadhi Gamya Vivesha Goshtam Sabrida Hasa Vinayam Jadapanga Moksham Sabrida Hasa Vinayam Jadapanga Moksham Pitva Mukunda Mukasaraka Akshi Bringais Pitva Mukunda Mukasaraka Akshi Bringais Tapam Jahur Viraha Jambaja Joshitovni Tapam Jahur Viraha Jambaja Joshitovni Tat Satratim 
samadhi gamya vivesha gosham Vrida hasa vinayam jala panga moksham So in the translation, with their bee-like eyes, the woman of the women of Vrindavan drank the honey of the beautiful face of Lord Mukunda, and thus they gave up the distress they had felt during the day because of separation from him. The young Vrindavan ladies cast sidelong glances and glances at the Lord, glances filled with bashfulness, laughter, and submission. And Sri Krishna, completely accepting these glances as a proper offering of respect, Enter the Calvary village. Access to the translation. So, Prabhupada's purport. In Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God, as Srila Prabhupada describes this incident as follows All the gopis in Vrindavan remained very morose on account of Krishna's absence. All day they were thinking of Krishna in the forest or of him herding cows in the pasture. When they saw Krishna in the forest, oh, when they saw Krishna returning, all their anxieties were immediately relieved and they began to look at his face the way drones, actually nowadays you have to explain it. Here drones means bumble by bees. <laughs> Not the more common form of drone nowadays. So they began to look at his face the way drones hover over the honey of the lotus flower. When Krishna entered the village, the young gopi smiled and laughed. Krishna, while playing the flute, enjoyed the beautiful smiling faces of the gopis." Unquote. The Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, is the supreme master of romantic skills, and thus he expertly exchanged loving feelings with the young cowherd girls of Vrindavan. When a chaste young girl is in love, she glances at her beloved with shyness, jubilation, and submission. When the beloved accepts her offering of love by receiving her glance and is thus satisfied with her, the loving girl's heart becomes filled with happiness. These were exactly the romantic exchanges taking place between beautiful young Krishna and the loving coward girls of Vrindavan. So, Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamiti Namine Namaste Sarasate Deve Gauravani Pracharya Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Paschati Deshatarya Krishna himself found the Gopi so interesting and especially Radharani that he decided to experience it directly himself and he became as Lord Chaitanya. Um, it's interesting because as we know, Krishna is omniscient. Uh, he knows everything and yet there is something magical about true love. And um, there's something... You can know something and yet it still amazes you even though you know it. So Krishna obviously knows that Radharani loves him. He's aware of that. They're a committed couple. But at the same time, but at the same time, uh, Krishna was simply astonished at her amazing qualities. And if you think about it, in any loving relationship, at least until the endorphins were off in the material world, in any loving relationship, um, each person becomes amazed and fascinated by the love of the other, and they try to they sort of meditate on it and try to understand, like, why does this person love me so much? What does this person see in me? Because generally, before people fall in love, their you know, self-esteem may not be too high. Unless you're a sannyasi, then of course there's no <laughs> there are no self-esteem issues. <laughs> but generally, we normal people. If um, sometimes when people don't have someone to love or are not loved by someone, uh, they may not 
think so highly of themselves. Anyway, I won't go too much into all this unfortunate psychology of the material world, but if you think about it, even in this world, when someone does fall in love or discover someone that really loves them, uh, it, it, it can be amazing that how this person loves me, because before being loved, one could feel that, uh, well, no one's going to love me. And then when someone does love you, you think, uh, what does this person see in me? Especially if you have great regard for that person, you think, how, what do they see in me? And why, how do they love me so much? And so, Krishna, who is Adi Purusha, the original adolescent. And if you think about it, I mean, Krishna, there's an old song, Hey Nitya. Remember that? Why must I be a teenager in love? <laughs> Do you know what <laughs> Anyway, uh, look silly if you know that song. <laughs> so, um, it's interesting. Krishna obviously could be any age he wants because he's God, so he makes the rules. But Krishna chooses to be a teenager. And uh, there's something very interesting about this. And of course, Radharani is also a his uh, teenage love. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when people are younger, like, like Prabhupada said, Krishna is 16 in the spiritual world, and Radha Rani, I guess, let's quote, probably in the same age. But Hostin always comes just after John Hostin. So, if someone is younger than that, they may have you know, what's called puppy love, or they may like someone, but it's actually one achieves a certain age. One achieves a certain age that uh, one's feelings become deeper and a person begins to understand more about life and more about themselves, more about other people. And then if you get, if you get a little too old, then all kinds of horrible things happen, like you have to get a job. <laughs> Obviously the reason I took sannyas. <laughs> unemployed and ecstatic. <laughs> so, so it's, it's interesting, just like I, uh, sometimes I, I mentioned, that, like if you look at Jane Austen, uh, the novels of Jane Austen, who was actually well, probably the most popular romantic writer in the English language in the, Latin, the last, uh, well, since novels began. And um, very chaste, and there's actually more body parts in the Bhagavatam than in Jane Austen. But if you look at her novels, very interesting, the, these very romantic novels, and they always end with the people who finally realize they're in love with each other and they get together. You never hear about children. You never hear about children. The story just, you know, the last chapter of each book is kind of like the post-game show, and you find out what happened to people, but you never hear about the children, because when you have children, then your, your duties in life, your focus dramatically changes. When you have children, the children have to be the center of your life, otherwise you're not a qualified parent. And so, when children are born, then, uh, you know, the guy becomes dad and the girl becomes mom, and, that, and that, that's your most important duty. And so, it's, it's, of course, a very important duty, and all of us are grateful for the, you know, whatever we have as parents, but um, it's not romantic. <laughs> Changing diapers and working all day, bringing home some money is not romantic. <laughs> and so Krishna chooses to be eternally at an age where there's like real love, you know, he's old enough so that it's real love, and yet it doesn't get to the age where it, it, um, it's not so romantic anymore. And so it's like the perfect, that's why they you know, talk about Speed 16. It's the uh, perfect age for romance. And that's, the, and, and that's approximately the age of Radha and Krishna. Of course, they have earlier pastimes that we know, and Krishna is sitting in the garments of the gopis. But if you think about it, uh, the gopis, you know, they have this huge crush on Krishna. And, of course, he likes the gopis, and so they, um, you know, he steals their garments, and they threaten him. And so they're very charming pastimes, but in terms of people really being a couple. Because you think about, it, although Krishna has pastimes with the gopis, and this is Radharani earlier, they're not so much a declared couple. They're still kind of just young people teasing each other, doing different things, and obviously in love. And so, anyway, so Krishna uh, was so 
amazed by the love of Radharani. Because in a sense, it's the ability to love that makes a person beautiful, that makes a person attractive. I mean, if someone, if you find out that someone really loves you, or is attached to you, suddenly you think differently of that person. You know, it may not be the right person, but still, you appreciate it. At least the person had the good sense and the intelligence <laughs> to love me. So Krishna was so impressed. I mean, in a sense, that is one of the one of the, one of the greatest testimonies of Krishna to Radharani is that he he creates this important avatar just to meditate upon her character because. To say that Krishna wanted to know how Radha loves him is to explore her character and the depth of her soul. And so Krishna came, and of course we know from the Chaitanya Charitamrita there is the internal and the external feature of that incarnation. And the external feature is saving the fallen souls and internally, Lord Chaitanya is relishing the love of Radharani. Now, in this world, conditioned souls, as Prabhupada always explained, want to lord it over. Everyone wants to win and be the best, and so on. And so, amazingly enough, I mean, if that's, it, it's Maya. I mean, for people that belong, for people that belong to religious institutions, it's Maya to watch television because it's unnecessary. I mean, there's so much amazing drama in the religious institution, so <laughs> that it's actually been done. But anyway, one amazing aspect is that even this simple... <laughs> I have to sneeze. <coughs> so, even this... Um, these two different aspects of Lord Chaitanya's incarnation uh, people, some people use it to lord it over other people, like you're just engaged in the external feature of Mahabharata appearance, whereas I'm a gopiologist, <laughs> which is an up and coming new science. Anyway, the point I wanted to make here on Radhastami is that it's silly, but not uncharacteristic. It's silly to. Um, to make this a type of uh, competition or one-upsmanship where I'm a better devotee than you because I'm into the internal feature, whereas because the, the, the point being that actually some spiritual teachers kind of tried to capitalize on this. <clears throat> the fact is that you can't separate the internal and external feature for obvious reasons. That it's not that Krishna just came to... First of all, you have to ask the obvious question. Uh, why in the world would Krishna come to the material world to experience Radharani's love? I mean, it's not like there's no space left in the spiritual world. Krishna has an infinite spiritual world, and since Radharani's love is the most intimate love that exists, why would Krishna do it in this world? Why would Krishna do it in the spiritual world? And why would he do it? Oh, thank you. Why would he do it on Earth? Why would he do it on a higher planet? And why in Kali Yuga? Why, why would Krishna come, why would Krishna experience the most intimate, exclusive spiritual love in the material world? on um, sort of a lower middle class planet in the Kali Yuga, which makes no sense at all. It only makes sense if you understand why that, that, that the intimate connection, the inseparable link, or, or unseverable link, better English, between the internal and external aspect of Lord Chaitanya's pastime. If you look at Krishna Leela in comparison, I mean, heads are rolling like... Uh, like anything. I mean, just a huge number, I mean, by the millions. And the Bhagavatam even talks about this. There are certain battles like in Jarasandha, who kind of won the clueless award. Uh, you know, they gave out Academy Award like, for most clueless in the Krishna Leela. <laughs> they would go to Jarasandha. 
who came 17 times. Actually, <laughs> if, you, if you do the numbers, every time Jarasandha came, he lost more soldiers than the soldiers killed at Kurukshetra. So he seemed to have almost inexhaustible resources. And um, he kept coming. And so in the Bhagavatam describes it, it, it's very gory. The Mahabharata also is like, I mean, it might even make uh, Mel Gibson kind of squeamish. <laughs> if, if you read some of these descriptions in the Mahabharata, they're like, oh, I mean, I don't know. It's like you can't get more gory than that. I mean, going to every little detail, blood and guts and body parts. And so, anyway, apart from that, um, so in Krishna Leela, Krishna Leela is at times extremely violent. And of course, in a sense, the reason is, I mean, among other reasons, that um, Krishna Leela is complete home entertainment. In the sense that Krishna, as Kunti says, Kunti says in her prayers that, that different sages give different reasons why you came to this world. And some of them say that Kirta Yishan, that in the future people will glorify this pastime. So Krishna carefully designs his Leela so that people can satisfy all their dramatic entertainment needs you know, on one channel, <laughs> on the Goloka channel. And so, as we see, there are so many violent movies out, and people, you know, people go by the tens and hundreds of millions to see these movies. And so Krishna has all these violent pastimes. And when he comes to Lord Chaitanya, though, it's actually amazing that in all of Chaitanya Leela, not one person is killed. Who's that Gopinath Patanayaka who was almost killed on you know, some kind of like, uh, I don't know, nasty form of a guillotine. But then he's not, he's spared. He's spared. And then, um, and I mean, the most violent thing that happens in Chaitanya Leela is that some uh, obnoxious Buddhist priest gets bopped on the head with a tray or something. <laughs> and that's about as violent as it gets. And so if you think about it, of course, there's a reason given that if you, if you kill if you're going to kill uh, offensive people in Kali Yuga, it would, it would just sort of amount to genocide <laughs> because of the huge numbers of sinful people. And even, you could say, well, maybe you could establish a criteria. Maybe people are fallen, but you could have a cutoff line, a red line, that um, if you cross this red line, then very bad things happen to you. And, but no, there's just no violence. And the reason is obvious, because Lord Krishna is in the mood of Radharani. Mm. And so, it's because Krishna is in the mood of Radharani that he becomes so compassionate. Even, of course, Jagai and Madhai were complete, almost like sociopaths, before they became saved. And then, uh, Lord Chaitanya didn't kill them. I mean, people got killed for so much less than Krishna Leela. So, Krishna decides to experience the love of Radharani in the material world, which is counterintuitive, and in the Kali Yuga, which is really counterintuitive, because it's, Krishna knows that only by invoking Radharani's mercy can the people of this age be saved? And so, um, so here we are. Here we are. And how do we respond to this? It seems to me that these events, like Rasastavi, these most important days of the year, are especially meant for us to rededicate ourselves to the real job, which is saving the planet. And Prabhupada had a strategy for saving the planet. It wasn't just like the Hail Mary pass, you know, for the ball or everybody go along and just throw the ball and hope somebody catches it. I mean, in a sense, Prabhupada did that. Prabhupada sent his disciples all over the world. And Prabhupada expertly the preach to, to every disciple that your service is very important. 
Prabhupada made all of us feel that wherever we were in America, Europe, Africa, South Pacific, India, that, that wherever a devotee was, his service was very important. And that's because that's what loving parents do. Loving parents make each child feel important. At the same time, Prabhupada had a specific strategy. It wasn't just a general strategy, encourage everyone. He had a specific strategy, which was that he, we, it was absolutely essential to establish his movement powerfully among Western people in the West. Actually, it's funny. I remember uh, when, when in the old days, uh, uh, guru reform days, um, I remember some people started criticizing me and it spread because I was so arrogant that I used the initials ATG, HDG, which they thought I meant his divine grace. I had to say, actually, <laughs> So there's something almost on that level of uh, brilliant penetration on the part of critics. Something sort of the same level. People say, why do you use the word West in the name of your program? And a lot of people have jumped on that. Like this is mundane, and it's this, it's that. And they forget. I was just following Prabhupada. He put the word West in his pronoun mantra which seems to be uh, not the most remembered fact in the world at the present time. But Prabhupada actually said, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschakya Desha Jaini. He could have said, he could have described himself as a savior of the northern countries, or the southern countries, although, to be honest, at the present time, there's no such thing as northern culture. And there's no such thing as southern culture. And increasingly, there's no such thing as eastern culture. Anyone's been to India lately? You know, you can go to a, some air conditioned mall and watch India's Got Talent. <laughs> so, look at, for example, immigration. I mean, I mean we, now, as we know, right now, Europe has an immigration crisis. We should be very thankful that our illegal immigrants are Catholic. <laughs> But as we know now, Europe has this huge immigration problem, but apart from the many other issues about it, these people are not fleeing and trying to get into Africa. They're not taking boats to India. They're not taking boats or, you know, or climbing over, traveling overland and not trying to get to Russia. I mean, how many... Even though Syria, for example, has a very uh, old alliance with Russia. In fact, Russia was... In fact, Syria... Uh, So Russia is actually Syria's most important ally, but there, no one's trying to get into Russia. The simple fact is that for good or evil, whether you like, whether we like it or not, you know, apart from judging it or you know self-righteously, whatever, uh, condemning the West, the point is that. Um, the West is the leading part of the world right now. Leading in both sense. Leading in the sense of most prestigious and leading in the sense of actually leading. And that's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. And uh, I think that the, what I would like to say here on Radharani's Holy Parents' Day 
is that I think devotees really need to um, what's the word? Chill? Be a little nicer about the West. And when, when I traveled around Europe, I mean, there's so many good devotees there. I, I was really impressed with all the good devotees, but I, I saw it was a, every country I went to was a national pastime to insult and denigrate and vilify the people of your country, the people you're trying to preach to. And to always put them down. It's, I, I was walking with Prabhupada one time in Rancho Park in Los Angeles, and uh, it was kind of a pastime. Prabhupada's young, immature disciples would always come to him and, on the walks and try to, it was like, see who can shock the Acharya, tell him like some horrible thing. Prabhupada, I just read in the papers that I don't know, in uh, somewhere in Indiana, priests were eating babies or something. That's not a true story, but I mean, I mean, that's the kind of, they would just try to find the most horrible uh, evidence that Kali Yuga had reached new depths, you know, the race to the bottom of Kali Yuga, which seemed to, of course, you know, make, it made it more necessary for us. It showed how really neophyte devotees trying to show how there's nothing but Krishna, nothing but bhakti yoga in the world by denigrating and, and insulting and putting down everything else. And of course, ignoring all the good qualities of these countries. So, when this devotee told, he came to Prabhupada, he was a book distributor, and he said, yeah, the Americans are really demonic. And Prabhupada actually uh, silenced him. Prabhupada silenced him and said, no. They're not. He said, they're actually good people. They're actually good people. They just don't have knowledge. You have to give them knowledge. And one uh, famous spiritual leader has just declared that all knowledge comes from only one part of the world. Which, it's good to know the computer science, the cure for polio, and uh, everything else came from only one part of the world. What Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is that knowledge comes from goodness. Knowledge comes from goodness. Krishna says that in, in many times in the Gita, he says that knowledge comes from, I mean, obviously the highest spiritual knowledge comes by surrendering to Krishna. But in terms of knowledge of how to live a decent life, how to dress yourself decently, how to eat properly, just you know, human relationships, all of that knowledge of how to be a good human being. Knowledge which is necessary for liberation, according to the Isopanishad, by the way. Vidyam cha vidyam cha jastad vedo bhayam saha avidya vidyam tirtva vidya ratamashnate That uh, one who knows both material and spiritual knowledge uh, by knowledge of the material world one crosses over death. And by spiritual knowledge, one enjoys immortality. That's in the Isopanishad. So Krishna says over and over again, for example, he says, tasmat satvam nirmalatvat prakashakam, anamaya, that the mode of goodness, because it is nirmala, it's like we call it, talk about the amalam puranam, the Bhagavatam spotless, mala means a stain or contamination, and so amala or nirmala is the same thing. And Krishna himself describes the mode of goodness as nirmala. You know, don't kill the messenger. That's what Krishna says. That the mode of that goodness, goodness, virtue, is, you could say relatively, relatively pure. It's not absolutely pure because it's still a material mode, as Krishna explains. But it's relatively pure. And so, Krishna says, therefore, goodness is prakashaka, which literally, in Sanskrit, means enlightenment. And he says in many other places that knowledge comes from goodness, talking about just basic knowledge of the world and how to live properly, not the highest spiritual knowledge. And therefore, and Prabhupada himself, there are many places, the quotes from Prabhupada, where he says that all the good people are not just in the East, there are many good people in the West. And I heard Prabhupada say that himself. He described Americans as being basically good people, and not to speak of Australians. 
who have in many of the advantages of Americans without the problem of being Americans. <laughs> so, um, that's what Prabhupada said. It's obvious, for example, if you look at third-party surveys of, of the most um, honest governments in the world, governments that actually take care of the people, provide medical care, and, you know, keep public spaces clean, provide education, almost all of them are in the West. Actually, almost all of them are in Northern Europe. So, and of course we know in, in South Asia we have some of the most corrupt governments in the world. Now, the point here is not to engage in East bashing. That's not my point. I'm just trying to say that in the West, the West is not just the polluted <coughs> loser of a civilization. There are many things in the West that are much more Vedic than in India. Not the ultimate spiritual things of understanding Krishna, but in terms of good government. I mean, how many times does Prabhupada talk about the duty of the government to take care of the people? And there actually are countries where they do that. Maybe not on the highest spiritual level, but in terms of all their human needs. And frankly, whether you're a devotee or a non-devotee, when you're sick or injured, you really want medical care. And you may be a very good devotee, but you still really want it. And when you're hungry, you really want some food. And if you have a family, you really want to live in a place where an honest person can earn an honest living and take care of their family. Without having to bribe everyone or, or denigrate, humiliate yourself because of the social system. So, today is our house to me. I don't think that we, I mean, we cannot simultaneously insult and denigrate people and attract them. I mean, there, are, there is a kind of person you can attract if you insult them, but it may not be the kind of people we, we're interested in. I mean, there are people with weird psychologies that are very attracted by, I don't know, you know, sadism on the part of the other. So, in the mood of Ravana, it's just like if you have a child. If, if a loving mother is feeding her child, and I've seen this so many times, everyone knows this. If the little child somehow won't eat what the mother is cooking, the mother will move heaven and earth until she finds some food the child will eat. Isn't it? Isn't that what it is? The mother will not stop, will not rest until she's found some healthy food that the child will actually eat. In the same way, a dedicated doctor, not someone that went to medical school because he wanted to join the country club later in life. Someone that actually is by nature a healer. If the so-called bona fide medicine or the prescribed medicine, what you normally give in that case, doesn't work, the doctor doesn't say to the patient, uh, that's the bona fide medicine. Sorry, sorry, Fred, you know, game over for you. The point is the doctor keeps searching for some way to help the patient. The mother doesn't say, sorry kid, this is the bona fide prasadam. If you don't like it, starve. You know, this is what I cook. If you don't like what I cook, starve. That's not what mothers tell little children. So, what about us? Prabhupada said that modern society is a headless body. But there's another problem, and that is the corollary to that, which is that the Hare Krishna movement is a disembodied head. So it's, it's like kind of some sci-fi movie, you know, we have this body floating around and there's this head floating. The simple, bless you. the simple fact is that bodies, headless bodies can't figure out how to connect with heads. It's heads that have to, because the head has the brain, it's the head that has to figure out how to connect with the body. So we can't simply indulge in the pastime if we are presenting Krishna consciousness in a certain way and people aren't accepting it, it's their fault and tough luck. You know, like, say hello to Yamaraj for me. Just like a, we, we chant, Vacha Kalpa Tarubya Chakrapa Sindhu, do we chant that just because we want mercy or do we chant that because we want to become merciful? So just as a loving mother doesn't say to her little child, 
uh, if you don't like what I cook, starve. A true Vaishnava, a true Vaishnava who is actually compassionate, if a true Vaishnava, he or she sees that we are presenting Krishna consciousness in a certain way, people are not accepting it, we don't just say, you know, say a little Yamaraj for me. Like the loving mother, like the doctor, we don't rest until we find some way to reach people. That is the mood of Radharani. That is the mood of Radharani. It doesn't mean changing basic things. Of course, Nubrin Nub- Nub- has a, uh, some historical memory of inappropriate changes. Let's just put it that way. So, if you study Prabhupada's teachings, Prabhupada says, don't change anything. Prabhupada says, adjust everything. So how do you reconcile these two, two statements? It's very simple. If you actually study Prabhupada's teachings, as I've studied, I mean, what I've concluded personally, is that there are three things we cannot change. Our philosophy, our practice, spiritual practice, and our institution, institutional framework. In the previous attempts at, uh, you know, what relevance, uh, all three things were changed in New Vrindavan. All three were changed. I'm not changing any of them. So any comparison between what we're doing and previous histories is, is a uh, sort of mindless comparison. In fact, Rupa Goswami, in, ch- in, in, in chapter 6 of the Bhakti Rasamrita to Sindhu, as Prabhupada presents it, the Nectar Devotion, makes a crucial distinction between basic principles, which you can never change, and details, which, as Prabhupada points out, we can change. Now, if we merge these two categories, if we merge these two categories so that all kinds of changeable details become unchangeable basic principles, we have, in effect, ruined the spiritual science. And it doesn't work. It's like there's a science, for example. Like, like let's say there's a certain way to build an engine. And if you don't, like, if you don't do it properly, it doesn't, the engine doesn't work. Or there's a certain way, for example, to treat certain diseases. If you don't take the medicine properly, it doesn't work. So, um, this is very dangerous. There may, for example, there's a medical science in the world. But if there are no doctors around, that won't help you. You may have a treatable disease, but if there are no competent doctors around, the existence of a medical science will not help you. Similarly, Prabhupada came to this world and gave a pure spiritual science, but that will not help the Western world if we are not real scientists. If we start flipping categories around and switching things, and suddenly something which Rupa Goswami never mentioned as a basic principle of Bhakti Yoga becomes a sacred, unchangeable principle, some superficial thing about bodily dress or this or that. So my concern is that we keep Prabhupada in the center, all of him, not a Prabhupada which has been filtered, which you know, everything but extremely conservative statements have been filtered out of the presentation and so that people get the impression that Prabhupada was extremely conservative about certain things about which he was actually often quite liberal. And, you know, it's in database. It's not like this is an undocumented personal communication Prabhupada made to me, so please believe me. No, this is public information. There are many, many, many statements from Prabhupada and many historical examples where he gave his disciples the flexibility and the freedom they needed needed to make the Hare Krishna movement work. And Prabhupada specifically said, if you look at his purport to uh, 4854, Prabhupada emphasized that what is convenient, the word he uses, in other words, what works. In India, will not always be convenient, will not work necessarily. 
in the Western countries like America. So, again, we are not talking about our basic philosophy. We are not talking about our basic spiritual practice. And we are not changing and uh, talking about uh, our, the institution that Prabhupada created and structured in a certain way. We're not talking about that, so uh, no one should have a panic attack. We're talking about external things which, which Rupa Goswami, you know, we're supposed to be Rupa Nuda, right? That Rupa Goswami and Prabhupada say are variable, changeable details that you adjust according to time and place, both in the Bhagavatam and in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It said that Krishna knows time and place. He, Krishna interacts when he comes to this world in a way that's appropriate for the time he comes to. For example, in Lord Chaitanya's time, it was appropriate to wear a little mini gumsha, you know, sannyasi. If I wore that today, I would probably be expelled from this country. <laughs> if you think about it, I mean, I remember one time one leader of this con was, we were having a personal conversation, he asked me, you know, please don't be offended, can I tell you something really heavy? So, okay. He said that I had been seen more publicly wearing a gumsha. If you look at all these back to I mean, not that I would parade around everywhere. <laughs> Gumsha is not like I'm, you know, I don't do that, but someone, once in some situation, people had seen me in a Gumsha. And uh, all these articles in Back to God in magazine about South Indian Brahmins, they always have their shirt off and they got these little Gumshas, and that's okay. But um, Lord Chaitanya wore much less than that, actually. And if you look at the paintings of the six Goswamis, they're depicted as wearing much less than that. So, <coughs> why did they dress like that? Because that was the custom at that time. It's not internal baby culture, that was the custom. And so one of the ways you should, and, and if you look at Krishna's life, if you look at Lord Chaitanya's life, we know there are hundreds of ways in which they fit in with their culture. Lord Chaitanya took sannyas from them, personal sampradaya. Why did they fit in? Because they were compassionate. Because they were compassionate. <clears throat> if you look at Krishna and Lord Chaitanya and other avatars, they did not place themselves radically outside their society. So this idea that devotees should place themselves far outside of society and build high cultural walls of separation, uh, it's simply not what Krishna does. And it's not what Lord Chaitanya does. And it's not what successful avatars, or successful acharyas have done. So, Prabhupada, as we know, came in a very special historical moment. Anyway, the real point I want to make here, and everything has changed, there is not a single example in the life of Prabhupada where he was trying a particular strategy or tactic in terms of the external stuff. And it didn't work, so he just kept doing it. There's no example of that. Prabhupada, of course, was a Grihastha. And when the Gaudiya Moth collapsed, or did, literally disintegrated, Prabhupada had, you know, he had many children, he had a wife, he had a home, he had responsibility. And so he did his best. He tried, to, he, in, in sort of an exemplary way, he tried to practice Grihastha Dharma, make a lot of money for, the, for the, his guru's movement. Prabhupada once said to me that there are some false uh, people sometimes falsely say that when I was a Grihastha, I was not actively involved in, in, in temple affairs. He said that in Allahabad, he was a member of the temple board, he would give classes. So Prabhupada was trying his best within the limitations of his situation at that time. And I should also mention that in India, especially back then, because we're talking about a very, I mean, India in the 1930s and 40s uh, was very culturally conservative, much more than now. And so it just, it just wasn't done that a householder takes a leading spiritual position. That was for sannyasi. Whereas in the Western world, in the modern world, it's much more acceptable and actually even necessary. So that men and women, you know, whether they're married or not married, the people take responsibility. But, so probably, but once, he, once he started, once he really took Vana Prasta, and then gradually that led to sannyas, um, <coughs> Prabhupada, he really went into high gear. Prabhupada gave that example of being an ideal Vihasta, but that once he realized the time has come, 
to really get the job done, the, the, the purpose for which Krishna sent him to this world. At that time, Prabhupada was relentless and I should say impatient in a very positive sense of the word. For example, he went to Jansi. He was given a building to you. Some society lady took it away. Prabhupada, he could have stayed in Jansi and tried to find another building. That's not what he did. He didn't stay in the, you know, there, that wasn't the only building in Jansi. But it's clear that Prabhupada realized that even if I do get another building, this is not really going to lead to a large Hare Krishna movement. It's not going to make Krishna consciousness a world religion. So he went to Delhi. He started printing back to God. It was sort of like one sheet, or a couple of sheets. It wasn't really a magazine. And he did that for a while. He just saw this is not leading to a powerful Hare Krishna movement. So he switched gears again. He went to Vrindavan. Someone suggested, and he heard Krishna telling him this, that better to do books, not just a little you know, sheet or newspaper, better to do books. So then he finished his books. And even after he got his books done, he tried to preach in India. He got his picture taken with the Prime Minister, with his Bhagavatam. But he realized just getting your picture taken with some big politician is not going to save the world. And so he tried in India, and he just, then he, just, he, he made this radical decision to come to the West. Now, Bhakti Siddhanta has sent people to the West, but you have to understand also to show how creative Prabhupada was, how bold he was. Prabhupada lived the first 50 years, the first 51 years of his life as a subject of the British Empire. The first 51 years of his life, Prabhupada was a subject of the British Empire. And Therefore, in that world, I mean, Prabhupada grew up the first 51 years of his life in a world that was completely London-centric. And so if, if a Godi of Aishnav would go to the West, there was only one place he would go, and that was London. It's like that cartoon where some, you know, some uh, sort of rednecks are fishing in this dry pond, and someone says, hey, that pond's dry. And I said, yeah, but this is where we always fish. <laughs> So at that point, Prabhupada decided to sail right past London and go to New York. That was very bold. No one had ever done that. That was not done in the Gaudiya Mahath. Generally, going to the West was not done. They tried it, didn't work, forget about it. Just like one uh, leader has, has recently posted a podcast saying that maybe we should just sort of give up the idea of saving the Western countries and uh, just be like the Amish, you know, maybe just have lots of babies. But anyway, um, so Prabhupada came to New York. That was very bold. It was unconventional. He did more bold, unconventional things. <clears throat> For example, he, he authorized preaching centers where men and women lived together, unmarried men and women. In India, that was scandalous and provoked all kinds of vicious criticism of Prabhupada. He was accused, you know, vicious, nasty criticism from obviously very stupid people. But Prabhupada said, these people do not understand what it takes to preach in the West. Now, there are many people, as, there are many people who um, have opinions about, you know, we don't need to make adjustments in the West, despite Prabhupada saying we do, in a, in a purport of the Bhagavatam. Unfortunately, none of the people that say that actually have success preaching in the West. And Prabhupada said, example is better than precept. So, Prabhupada came to America. He went to Butler, Pennsylvania. And, no offense to my dear disciple Mahalakshmi, who's from Butler, but at a certain point, Prabhupada realized, oh my God, I'm in Butler, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that when Prabhupada arrived in Butler, he immediately announced to, the, to these very good people, the Agarwals, that, you know, I'm just here for a short time, this is not really my mission here. No. He went to Butler. He thought, okay, Krishna sent me to Butler, so let's start the mission here. But then he realized, well, I think I better move on. So then he went to New York. In New York, he didn't know what to do, so he went around and he sold. Prabhupada once said to me, actually, 
Prabhupada said to me in the day I took sannyas, uh, because the GDC had voted I should open up Spain, where there, was no, there were no ISKCON centers. And, I, and Prabhupada said, like, okay, so what are you going to do? It was like, okay, kid, because I was 23 years old. I mean, I took sannyas several years before my brain was fully formed. <laughs> which is, explains some of the problems in this kind of that time. <laughs> so anyway, um, so Prabhupada, I mean, went to see Prabhupada, and, and his move was like, okay, I gave you sannyas, kid, now how, how are you going to stay out of trouble? Tell him, you know, what are you going to do? Don't just sit around and, you know, serve the deities by sampling Mahaprasada. <laughs> You know, quality control of Mahaprasada <laughs> as Sanyas Dharma. So, so I told Prabhupada that the GDC had voted that I should go to Spain. And Prabhupada said, first get books and then go. And then he told me, when I came to your country, as I was getting off the boat, I had no idea if I should turn left or right. That's what Prabhupada said, as he was walking down off the boat. He had no idea which way to turn. He said, but I was not, but I had confidence because I brought my books. He brought the first canto from India. 600 books, 200 of each, of each volume. So, so Prabhupada came to New York. He just, he just arrived, like waiting to see what Krishna would do. Then he met this Dr. Mishra. And so it's obvious for a time that was the game plan. The game plan was Hang out with Dr. Mishra and tell the students the real truth and see what happens. And of course, Dr. Mishra didn't appreciate the competition. It didn't work, so Prabhupada shifted gears again. And he got you know, his, place, his little place on 2nd Avenue. And, and so if you look at Prabhupada's life, we started Harinam. Harinam was the center of the movement. Then Prabhupada saw the temples were not doing so well financially. He also saw that his books we're not going out, so we shifted gears again. Okay, there was a time when Sankir Harinam was a center, it shifted to book distribution. And then he started a political party. There was a time when every day in the morning walk, Prabhupada would just talked to us about the In God We Trust party. I mean, he was completely enthused about it. He was excited, and that's really all he wanted to talk about. But then when he saw there were certain, as I say, undesired consequences, he shifted gears. He said, well, no, then we have to cut back. And so if you look at Prabhupada at every stage of his life, it's not like he comes, you know, from some Vaikuntha Mount Sinai with the, you know, the commandments of all practical details of how to spread the movement. If you look at Prabhupada's real life, he's constantly learning about, about how to do this. He admitted, uh, Lashimoni <coughs> spoke to a, a, a family in, in Calcutta who were old family friends of Prabhupada. And Prabhupada admitted to them in confidence that the movement was spreading so quickly. He was just like trying to keep it under control because it grew so explosive. If you look at Mukunda Goswami's wonderful book, his biography about Prabhupada, Miracle on 26... Tw Miracle on 2nd Avenue. Yeah, it's a great book. It's obvious that in the early days of the movement, Prabhupada took the role of being the Acharya, the spiritual leader, and trusted his Western disciples to figure out within the parameters he gave them how to spread the movement in their countries. There's a famous story in Europe when Prabhupada went to Sweden. One of the senior devotees asked him what, how they should spread the movement there. Prabhupada said, I don't know, it's your country, you figure it out. <laughs> and then when Prabhupada, the movement grew so quickly, it actually grew beyond the ability of his disciples to keep it under control because they were all young and experienced and grew so quickly. But when Prabhupada had to take the role of giving more details about practical things, he didn't like it. He complained about it. He was constantly complaining, get me out of here. I want to sit down and write books. I don't want to be dragged into these things. So Prabhupada said things for the time, but he would say something else and he saw it didn't work out. So taking all these detailed instructions, which are not basic principles, according to Rupa Goswami and according to Prabhupada, Prabhupada never claimed these are eternal details. Plus, consider that during the entire time that Prabhupada 
was in America or in the West or, or in the Western world even before he left this world. It was a completely abnormal, atypical, anomalous historical period, totally different from the Western world before and after Prabhupada. And so we have all these just pragmatic, detailed instructions which apply to a world which doesn't exist today. And even during Prabhupada's presence in this world, by 1974, according to statistics, the movement had leveled off. It was no longer growing the way it did before. And by 75, it started to decline in terms of numbers. Not only us, I mean, back in those days, every Indian guru that had, you know, even like 79 cents worth of charisma attracted so many followers. Guru Maharaji, who was, no, what can I say? <laughs> I mean, ridiculous. He filled up the Astrodome in Houston. We couldn't fill up the Astrodome. If Prabhupada would have personally come, I really doubt we could have filled up the Astrodome. Prabhupada never had a program like that on anything like that scale. And yet Guru Maharaji was nothing compared to Prabhupada, spiritually. Nothing. He filled up the Astrodome. There, there was quite a number of famous Indian gurus in America. Now, there are none. The world has changed. And by 1977, Prabhupada knew it. And that's why he told Giriraj Swami just days before he left. He asked Giriraj, will this movement survive when I'm gone? And Giriraj, as, as he explains it, gave kind of like the standard company answer. Yes, Prabhupada, if we chant Hare Krishna and follow the principles. And Prabhupada indicated that no, that's not enough. There has to be intelligence. There has to be intelligence. Every moment in history when Vaishnavism actually flourished, it's because the Vaishnavas adapted to the culture they were in. I personally am trying in Prabhupada's service because I can't face Prabhupada. What will, how will I face Prabhupada after all the special attention he gave me, after the trust he placed in me? How can I face him if I saw this major problem, namely the, the drastic reduction of his Western Hare Krishna movement, this drastic, this major historical problem, and I, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, as a scholar, as a servant of Prabhupada, as a student of Vaishnava history and social science, that I understood the problem and I didn't try to fix it. I mean, how could I face Prabhupada if I didn't do that? And so if I had to choose between, you know, having everyone like me, or being true to Prabhupada, I'm going to be true to Prabhupada and speak the truth as I know it. Yeah. So if someone has a better idea, I've come up with a plan. If someone has a better idea, I will be eternally grateful to you. Because I love the concept of lazy intelligence. <laughs> and at my age, I mean, I can really understand what Prabhupada always used to say. Prabhupada always used to say that about his Jaladuta voyage, which we're celebrating this year, he always used to say, at that age, nobody wants to leave home. At that age, nobody wants to leave home. And I can really experience that now. Prabhupada, when Prabhupada got on the Jaladuta, he was approximately two years older than I am now. Two years older. And I really understand those words more than ever in my life. Prabhupada said that in other words, at a certain age, all you want is to live in peace, and I could write books, I could chant Hare Krishna, I could hang out at natural food stores. <laughs> <laughs> so, if someone has a better idea of how to get the Western Hare Krishna movement going, uh, I will be eternally grateful to you. But since I haven't seen one, I'm bothering everybody with my ideas. And since today, again, today is Radharani's appearance day, and what characterizes Radharani more than anything in terms of her appearance in this world is half of Lord Chaitanya, which is really what Krishna Kapi Raj says. There's, I think one of the most profound and astonishing statements in all of our literature is a statement made in the first chapter of Chaitanya Charitamrita about Radha and Krishna that 
Eikat Mano, that um, they are actually two people are the same soul. That's literally what it means in Sanskrit. Eka is one, Atma means soul, and Atmano is the dual form, means two souls. So they are, they, the one, the one soul is two. One soul is two persons. It, it's incredibly profound. You could meditate upon that for millions of years. So, the Radha Rani, Radha Rani, who is the ocean of mercy, if where, I mean, are we really an ocean of mercy? If we look at the Hare Krishna movement, let's say in the West, would we, I mean, would it, would it, would it say a, 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 an objective third party observer conclude that there's no other religious movement, say in America, where the members are so deeply concerned about other people, where the members will do whatever it takes to reach people, and they will adjust any adjustable detail, which is not one of the basic parts of their philosophy or practice, according to Rupa Goswami, not according to someone's imagination about what Vedic culture is. Would, um, I mean, is, is that us? Are we those people? Just like a loving mother that, 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 that will not stop, will not rest, until she finds healthy food that her child will eat. Are we like that with the Western people? Will we stop at nothing? Do we try everything? Are we willing to go the extra yojana? You know, I mean, are we... Is that us? Or have we, are we kind of sedate and we put our confidence in a Gyata Sukriti? You know, don't worry about the fallen souls. They're piling up the Gyata Sukriti points. And they will actually be purified uh, unconsciously and involuntarily. Are we passively waiting for Gyatu Sukriti to pile up and prophecies to come true? Or are we like Prabhupada, actively going out there and stopping at nothing within the parameters Prabhupada gave us, doing everything humanly possible to make people comfortable with us and to bring Krishna to them? I mean, unless you answer the question yourself, I know, what, I know what the answer is in my mind as far as are we... Do we try as hard? Are we as concerned? Do we see the non-devotees in the West as actual people whose feelings matter, whose preferences are important to us? Or are they simply philosophical categories? They are the conditioned souls. And they will be, they will be purified involuntarily and unconsciously. And that's how the movement spreads. Despite Krishna saying in the Bhagavad Gita, the last verse of chapter 17, that uh, Agata Sukriti doesn't give so much benefit. Read the verse. And Rupa Goswami says that if we think that uh, the results of it, there's some benefit, but Krishna says, not so much. And Rupa Goswami says that um, if we think the results of bhakti are mechanical and automatic, that will destroy our bhakti. So can we simply go out there and mechanically purify people against their will or without their knowledge, purify them to the point where this movement really becomes successful? No, no we can't. And Krishna gives a very different picture in Bhagavad Gita. Even if you look at the Ajamila story, in which Ajamila, just by chanting the holy name unconsciously, is saved, keep in mind that the Ajamila story is simply a confirmation of what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, that neha uh, become a vidyate. That there's no loss or diminution. Ajamila simply was restored to his previous position. Ajamila had been a very sincere Vaishnava who worshipped Krishna with love and devotion. And then he fell down and became degraded. And at the time of, when he was going to die, Krishna fulfilled his promise in Bhagavad Gita. Neha become a But there's no loss or diminution. And restored him to the position he had earned by his own spiritual achievement. We should, I mean, there's all kinds of confusion in my view. Take the term causeless mercy. The term causeless, which we use all the time, 
actually is not found literally in Shastra. I'm not saying it, it's a wrong term, Prabhupada used it. I'm not saying there's something wrong with it. It's just not used in Shastra. You will not find in the Bhagavatam the term, literal term, causeless mercy. The reason being that mercy itself means causeless. It is well, everyone should know that in history there's always a tension between mercy and justice. Justice means you get what you deserve. Mercy means, well, you deserve this, but I'll be merciful. If a judge is merciful because a judge wants to build his or her own reputation, that's not mercy. It's just uh, <coughs> self-promotion. To reduce someone's sentence because the person will give me money, that's not mercy. That's just corruption. If it's actually mercy, then it has no material cause, because if we simply go by material causes, we would not give mercy, we would give justice. So therefore, the term causeless mercy is not, it's not a bad term, it's, but it, it's simply a, what, what I call a didactic redundancy. It's saying the same thing twice for emphasis. But the problem is that sometimes we interpret that non-Shastric, literally non-Shastric term, in a way which is against Shastra. For example, by saying that uh, I don't deserve to be a devotee, but Krishna brought me here. What about Krishna's statement in Bhagavad Gita? Samo Sarva Bhutesha, I'm equal to everyone. What about the unqualified people that didn't become devotees? What about Krishna's statement that one joins the Hare Krishna movement in this life enthusiastically because of previous activities in a former body? What about, Krishna, <coughs> what about Krishna's statement that Jejata uh, Mamprapadyante, that as you approach me, I reciprocate precisely as you approach me. I mean, are all those statements wrong? Are all these and other statements in the Bhagavad Gita simply wrong? And actually, there's no reason why you're devoted? And therefore, there doesn't need to be a reason for other people becoming devotees. There's no need to actually please them. No need to take their feelings seriously. It's all involuntary. It's all automatic. Even though Rupa Goswami says that destroys bhakti, that attitude. So, before I get myself in more trouble, um, are there any questions on these points? And, and to, to just last sentence, and then we'll have to take questions. The whole point in my mind is really take your water running seriously and becoming very compassionate, very merciful, and just doing whatever it takes within Prabhupada's boundaries, doing whatever it takes to make this movement work in the West. Why West? Because that's the word Prabhupada used. Nir vishesha shunyavari pasyatya desha tarini. Prabhupada used the word West. Was Prabhupada, that's, how Prabhupada, that's how Prabhupada defined himself. That was in his Pranam Mantra. He gave us a Pranam Mantra in which he said, that's this is who I am. I'm the person that came to save the Western countries. So we need to take this very seriously and just, and, and just uh, get the job done. Any questions? Yes. Yes, Hare, please. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Thank you uh, for a nice lecture. So one of the things you were uh, talking about, about Prabhupada in India is that when the Bodhi Moth collapsed, he didn't try to, you know, he worked within the Gaudiya Math, but after a while, seeing that it was just totally broken, he left and started his own institution and started the Islam. Yes. Right? He didn't try to be the reformer within Gaudiya Math. He said, I can make big, bigger results by doing my own thing within my own institution. So with Krishna West, a lot of the preaching that I see that you do is actually preaching to the ISKCON devotees, trying to convince them to think more rationally and to follow Prabhupada. But instead of trying to reform ISKCON, when Krishna West had bigger impact on spreading Krishna consciousness, if it just institutionally separated itself from ISKCON and just focused on preaching to the outsiders, to the non-devotees, instead of preaching to Islam and trying to reform yes. Islam? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, my situation is not at all analogous to Prabhupada's situation. When Prabhupada made his decision, there was no Gaudiamath to be in because the Gaudiamath had disintegrated. Uh, Islam still exists as a united institution and it's still Prabhupada's mission. That's the first point. 
Um, that's a very key point. Um, and I still believe, in, another point is that um, Prabhupada is the only person I see who actually has the purity and the potency to um, create an international society for Krishna consciousness. It's like that old song by Bob Dylan, no, 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 it ain't me, babe. It's, um, <laughs> I mean, I don't have Prabhupada's purity and I don't have Prabhupada's potency and therefore uh, to, uh, I would, uh, yeah, it's Prabhupada. So, uh, because this con still exists as a united institution, it's still Prabhupada's mission, uh, it's clear to me my duty is to do all I can to to serve this time, to try to persuade devotees that this is what we need to do. And actually, based on my travels, I find that most of the Islam boys I speak to, most of them, uh, really understand this. So I am uh, proud, I, I know from listening to Prabhupada and watching him that it was very important to him to keep his movement together. And so I am uh, so for Prabhupada. And also, as a student of world religions, I'm aware that it is actually better to have a united movement. For example, everyone in the world knows who the Pope is. No one in the world knows who the head of the Methodist Church is. I don't even know if Methodists know that. You know, the Lutheran Church, or this church, or that church. And, and so, uh, it's better for the world to have a united movement. I'm not a little Prabhupada wannabe. And uh, I don't see anyone, including myself, that really has the... If the purity or, or, the, or the spiritual ability uh, to do that. Because, it, let's say, if I started something like that when I died, uh, would, the people that followed me would make a bigger mess. <laughs> yes? Marge, I just have a question uh, about you were talking about how you love lazy intelligence. So, I mean, unlike yourself, I stepped out of Hare Krishna movement and just became a business person. So I'm kind of like from the outside looking in. And I come back to New Vrindavan where I lived for eight years. And I see all this devotional activity from the past, how it manifested in the form of like going to the palace, you know, the marble is still there, all is still being worshipped there. You know, it's so gorgeous inside. You come into the temple, you know, you see the effect. So Kirtanatha's idea was kind of like a lazy, intelligent thing. I'm not saying he executed it properly. But in the sense that when I was young, I was sent out to the parking lots and the street lights distributing Prophet's books. He created a situation here where busloads of people were coming, and I think people still come. I don't live here, but it appears a lot of people still come here. So is is this isn't this part should be part of this con's like rejuvenation of Prophet's mission to make this place like gorgeous? I mean, of course, the New Vrindavan's always an important part of this con. So how are we going to do it when when I mean it's going to take something like? Three to four million dollars to resurrect the Anyway, what they say that a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. And what we really need to do is to get the Hare Krishna movement going in the West so it's a powerful, successful movement in the West and that will take care of everything. Yes? Great answer. Thank you. I have more of a statement. Um, I've spoken to many people outside in my and if you look at them as a big group, let's say the Karmis, it can be overwhelming until you realize that everyone is an individual spirit soul. And they can look at us as the devotees and be scared of us too. I've seen it many times. But we can we have to go out and look at everyone as a spirit soul when we are out there and try to Yeah. And and, and their and their feelings matter. Yeah. Even God reciprocates, so if we don't care about their feelings, they won't care about ours. If you open up a restaurant for Krishna and your attitude is, I don't care what people want to eat, this is what I want to cook. <laughs> so in the same way, why is music different than food? There's just different, you know, different ways we spread the movement. Yes, we should go out in public and we should teach people Mahamantra. 
but we should do it in a way that people will, you know, buy it and eat it. In other words, we, 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 we should uh, find, just like in a restaurant, we should find a way to publicly present Krishna's holy names so that people really like it and identify with it and feel comfortable with it. And that there are two kinds of attention we can get. One kind of attention is, hey, this is entertaining, this is exotic. That's not the kind of attention. I don't want to just entertain people by doing something exotic. I want people to look at me, my life, and say, maybe I could do that. Maybe that could be my life. That's the kind of attention I want. I want people to follow and not simply be entertained. So, and they're not the same thing. I mean, some things are entertaining and also people want to do it, but to me that's a real challenge to us. How do we present the movement in the West that people don't simply find us to be exotic and entertaining, but actually want to follow us? So it's a little late. Uh, yes? One more question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I agree with you, actually. But I have one question. The question is, you say you can adjust within the parameters of the Prabhupada's instructions or whatever. Uh, who's to determine what those parameters actually are? Uh, well, for one thing, we find them and then Prabhupada teaches what they are. But that's also open to interpretation by different individuals. Uh, but they're either in the list of fundamental principles or they're in the list of changeable details. It's either in this list or it's in that list. Very simple. And if it's in the list of details, then things have to be done in a way that is um, the works. Quick follow-up question, Hare Krishna. So yeah, very quickly because yeah, um, So Prabhupada, you know, you were saying that you're, you don't feel that you're qualified or you're not putting enough, and the odds are not in your favor. Well, not odds. It's just I'm very, I'm very clear that at this point in time, it is not Krishna's desire or Prabhupada's desire. Uh, that I do something like that. And so I would give me the old college truck. But Prophet desired for Krishna consciousness to be spread to the West. Yes. And he did whatever it took to spread Krishna consciousness to the West, even if it meant to leave his spiritual master's institution. However, I am at the present time, right here in this con, one of this con's most important North American centers in Vrindavan, talking to everybody. And uh, so, and and so I understand that some people will agree with me, some people may prefer to do things a different way, uh, but there are hundreds and thousands of this kind of devotees who agree with me. And so it's not that I'm in a hostile movement or something, it's, so I'm actually very encouraged. I just made a tour of Europe, and I was very, very encouraged by the uh, very positive, extremely positive reception. The last country I was in, the Temple President said this was the most important visit of this kind of leader in many years. And, and I, I mean, I got letters like that from many, many European temples saying that this was like so important. It, it's so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very clear about my duty. So thank you all very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.